Today is Easter. He is alive. He is alive. He is alive. How many of you great? Uh, you know, people, do you know that Jesus is alive in you? Wave your hands. Amen. It's great just to be here. And uh, I will just tell you, uh, you know, uh, one thing that Pastor Peter is absolutely right. I have a beautiful wife. And she gets more beautiful each day. And we've been married for 31 years. But the start was anything but beautiful. You know, one of the most immemorable days. Well, a day to forget, if you know what I mean. In, uh, in our life was actually on our wedding day. Because everything that could conceivably go wrong, went wrong on our wedding day. 31 years ago. We were married in the UK. And... Uh, uh, on the wedding day, I remember being spruced up, ready to go, you know, and, uh, and got into the car and uh, my best man, he was also spruced up and uh, he was going to drive me to the church. Within half an hour, the service was going to start and, you know, I had my old Ford Escort. That was all I could afford. I'd just become a doctor. I didn't have much money. I old Ford Escort and he put the, slipped the key into the ignition, turned it and it went click, 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 click. And uh, there was absolutely nothing there. My battery was flat. And uh, he ran out in horror, abject horror, you know, looking for somebody to push the car. It was one of these manual cars. You could push them. And I sat there silently thinking, with no, all dressed up, nowhere to go. And uh, thinking, God, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> and then he came out with a whole group of students, you know, woken up on a Saturday morning, you know, at, at 9.30 in the morning. And, and they looked bemused. This, this guy, you know, all dressed up, nowhere to go. And they gave me a push. And eventually the car started. And that's how they got me to the church on time. So people often ask me, uh, you know, how, how was your wedding like? I say, well, really, I had no choice. I was literally pushed into the arms of my wife. And that's how I got married. <laughs> and other things went wrong on that day as well. Uh, you know, just a week before, I had lost my contact lenses. Now, it's old days, you must understand, uh, 30 years ago when we wore semi-permeable gas lenses. You know those things? You had to grind the glass and all that kind of stuff. And so I rang my optician. And they couldn't produce a set of lenses for me uh, in anything under three weeks. So there was no way uh, I could get my set of lenses. So I, I would walk down the aisle short-sighted. My beautiful bride on that day decided not to wear her glasses as well because she really wanted to look beautiful, you know, more beautiful. So, you know, we walked down the aisles, totally short-sighted. It was really a case of the blind marrying the blind. You know, that's how we started as well. And then, you know, we didn't go, and we, we didn't take any rehearsals for the wedding ceremony, you know. And so, because we, we didn't have much time. And so, uh, I didn't know really what to do, uh, except that I thought I'd seen a few weddings and I thought I knew what to do. Uh, so, when it came to the point in the ceremony where the minister then said to me, Philip, you may now kiss your bride. And I thought, that's easy, but how do I get to her face? I noticed there was a veil over her. <laughs> So I decided the best thing to do, that's logically lift up the veil, which I did. Then I kissed my bride. And then I thought, what do you do next? I pulled down the veil again. <laughs> and everybody burst out laughing just like you did, you know. And I thought it was so embarrassing. It was a good thing it wasn't videoed. We could not afford to have it videoed then. So, you know, otherwise it would be terrible to try to, lift, try to lift down that embarrassment. And then it came to the cake cutting ceremony. So after that, we adjourned to the tea room in, this, in, this, in, the, in the church where we were married. And our, our friends were there. And we got married on a fantastic, extravagant budget of 150 pounds. That was all. We got married on. So everybody who could chip in to provide free sandwiches, everything else we took, you know, we, we gladly received that. And my brother's girlfriend uh, had offered to make us a wedding cake for that day and for free. And we said, oh, we gladly received that. But what she didn't tell us was she had never made a wedding cake before. <laughs> and so when it came to the cake cutting ceremony, and there we were, you know, both of us holding the knife together, you know, and we, we gently sliced into the cake. And we wouldn't cut. She had made the icing the thickness of concrete slabs. 
And so we thought, this is terrible. Everybody was laughing. And we decided to use a little bit more force. Still wouldn't cut. Then we tried to saw through it, you know. It still wouldn't go through. Then we decided to gently tap it, try to break it open. Still wouldn't. And then eventually, you know, in a completely kind of last effort, we did the samurai thing. Both of us raised up the knife and went, I and chopped it. That's how, we, that's how we cut the wedding cake on that day. And that's how we started a wedding. It was a real kind of El Chipo wedding. But sometimes we think it's not the way you start. It's the way you continue and the way you finish that makes a difference. Can somebody say amen? amen. 31 years later, we're still very much in love. It's you know, a great you know, marriage. We, we have a great time. We love each other more. And each anniversary, we clink our glasses and say, last year was great. This coming year is going to be greater. And, you know, so, so I'm really grateful for that. But we could have lived a life of regrets. And we could have lived a life of regrets to say, but suppose... But suppose, but suppose we, we, we didn't go for an El Chipo wedding. But suppose we had rehearsed for a ceremony. But suppose we had really got the cake made properly by, by some baker somewhere, you know, rather than this El Chipo stuff. But we could have lived a life of regrets. I don't know about you, but it is possible for you to live a life of regrets. And that life of regrets is encapsulated in this phrase that goes, but suppose... But suppose I didn't get married. Suppose I didn't get the divorce. But suppose I passed my exams. But suppose this hadn't happened to me. But suppose, you know, my health had been better and had looked after it. But suppose my kids weren't like that. But suppose we could live a life of regrets. It's encapsulated in the word, but suppose. But for us, we chose not to use that phrase. We chose to chart forward with the word that whatever the devil tries to do in our minds, and trying to say, but suppose this, but suppose, but suppose, to make us to live a life of regrets, we choose to say, but God. Can somebody say it, amen? amen? Somebody say, but God. You can live a life of but suppose, but suppose. But God wants you to live a life of but God. But God is going to do this. But God has done this. But God will do greater things and exceedingly abundantly beyond all you can ask or think. Somebody say, but God. Somebody say it loud one more time, but God. Turn to your neighbor and say, but God. Now, just so that you know that God is a great God, I'll just give you a quick sneak peek uh, into where I come from, okay? Uh, I come from, can I have the video? Uh, can I have the PowerPoint? I come from Sutra Harbor. This is where I am, okay? It's in East Malaysia in the beautiful city of Kota Kinabalu. You don't have to learn to pronounce it. It's called KK. Somebody say KK. Sutra Harbor Resort is a 1,000-room hotel. Smack in the middle of that. Is the church that I pastor and it is there 24 7 it's not just like we meet there for two hours and then we take all our equipment down we're there 24 hours a day seven days a week embedded in there long term on a long-term lease it's a wonderful place and when we look out of the church this is what we see okay and sometimes we just wander down to the poolside and after lunch sometimes we eat by the poolside how many would like to come visit me sometime I just said I see the hands going up all around. So see you sometime this year or next year, okay? But when you come, please make sure you tell the Sabah Tourism Promotion, Malaysian Tourism Promotion Board that you came as a result of Pastor Philip Lin telling you during the promotion. Uh, then at least I'll hope to get some commission. Uh, up to now, I've not been paid yet. But if you do come, uh, just say you're from EEC and we'll try to treat you really well. Give you a kind of VIP welcome, okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going. Hallelujah. In the coming days, you know, of course, we can't remain in the hotel forever. In the coming days, uh, God is going to provide a place for us in the city. And somewhere within this huge development complex, uh, this is just a model, this huge development complex, Skyline will move in the coming years. So while we're still there, come, okay? Make a beeline and join. But today, I want to speak about, but God, but God. The phrase and the, the passage I want you to read with me together is from Ephesians chapter 2. It's really an Easter passage because it's about God making things alive. It's about the power of Jesus that can make alive our lives, our families, our future, our destiny. And uh, so it, it and it's premised upon, starts off with, but God. And it's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. So if you, if you can read that on the screen, I want you to read it loud. Read it together with me. Are you ready to do it now? Are you ready to read it loud? Ready? Let's go. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love 
with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You know, the opposite of but God is actually but suppose. And this is something that can haunt our lives. You know, we can live a life of regrets or we can live a life of but God. But suppose was actually the language of a man called Moses. Because when God appeared to him and said to him, Moses, I want you to go back to Israel, uh, to Egypt, and lead the people of Israel, the Israelites, out of slavery, out of Egypt. Now, at that point in time, Moses had been functioning as a shepherd for 40 years in obscurity in the backside of the Sinai Desert. You remember, he grew up as a prince of Egypt, but as a result of killing an Egyptian slave driver, Pharaoh was after his life, he fled as a fugitive into the Sinai Desert and then served for 40 years as a shepherd, looking after the sheep of his father-in-law. And at that point in time, all his dreams were shattered. He was a man full of guilt, full of regrets in his life. He had tried to set himself up as the leader of the Israelites in Egypt, but they had rejected him. He was a rejected man. He was a broken man. He was a downcast man. He was a man in despair. And then with no sense of destiny or hope. And then God appeared to him. After 40 years when God took Egypt out of Moses, all the Egyptian pride and arrogance after Moses, God said to Moses, Moses, I'd like you to go back and lead your people out of slavery. And Moses' response, which is articulated by him for us in Exodus chapter 4 verse 1, was a but suppose, but suppose. This is what he said. He said, then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me. Or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. But suppose, God, you asked me to do this. But suppose, God, you asked me to believe and trust in you for this healing. But suppose it doesn't take place. God, you said that my family would be saved. But suppose, you asked me to, to say that if I give, it will be given to me exceedingly abundantly. But suppose, but suppose, if you have that language in our mouth, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That would be the language of our hearts. And that would trap us. If you have the language of but suppose, it would do three things to our lives. It would do three things. But you know, Moses was a but man. In that sense that when God appeared to him and told him to go by faith, all he could say was but, 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 but. He was a but man. Do you know what I mean? You know what's the difference between sheep and goats? You know, goat, sheep always go, Master, Master, that's how they sound. The goats will always go, but, 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 but. They have lots of buts, you know. All kinds of buts they have. It reminds me of a rural English preacher who uh, was preaching on Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, on but suppose, on the buts of our life. You know, the excuses we make before God for the things we don't do in our life. All the excuses, the buts of our life. It was such a well-received sermon in his rural village church that he decided he would preach the same sermon on his pastoral exchange program in the United States the following month. What he didn't realize was the word but, spelt with a double T, a word not used in rural England, but used in the United States in those days, referred to the posterior aspect of the human anatomy. Your backside, you know what I mean? So, you know, he, he didn't know that. So he went uh, to this vast, huge church in New York on his first Sunday morning. He sent it to the pulpit after being introduced. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, he read the text. He said, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen the topic of my sermon this morning uh, is on the three buts. And everybody looked shocked. You know, the eyes popped out of socket, the jaws dropped. But he was oblivious of what he had said. He said, he proceeded. He said, point number one, everyone has a but. Then he said, point number two, it is easy to see other people's butts. <laughs> but point number three, he said, but it's very difficult to see your own butt. <laughs> so, you know, Moses was a butt man. He had all kinds of, but suppose this, but suppose that. 
Now, but suppose will do three things in your life. Firstly, it will paralyze you. Paralyze you spiritually. Now, in medical science, there is a, a kind of stroke called the locked-in syndrome. As a stroke that takes part in a, a particular part of your brain from a particular kind of blood vessel that's blocked off and it, that particular part of the brain is affected and all the muscles of your body are paralyzed. But you're alive. The only muscles that are not paralyzed are your eyes. You can move your eyes, but you can't talk. You can still breathe, but you can't talk. You can't move your limbs. You are a locked-in corpse, alive, but totally paralyzed. It's a very, very sad state of affairs. But for Moses, he was literally like that. For 40 years, he just wanted to forget about what God had called him to do. He just wanted to get on with his life and finish it off in obscurity and anonymity, in the backside of the Sinai Desert, and no name, agrarian peasant, looking after sheep. That's all he wanted to do. Forget about the past, full of regrets, full of remorse, full of dark things, full of murder, full of anger, full of loss. Just he lost it. Some of you, you live in there because you're locked in there. But today, as Pastor Peter said, he's alive. And he's alive so that the tomb or whatever it is that's in your life cannot hold you in. Somebody say, amen. amen. Don't allow the devil to lock you in. Because if he allows you, you allow him to lock you in. Your language will always be, but, but suppose. Yes, God calls me to preach and share the gospel and not to be afraid. But, but suppose. Oh, God calls me to give generously. But suppose. God calls me to reach out to my family. But suppose. You will live that life. It will paralyze us spiritually. You know, and some of these are, are kind of fears in our life. And one of the things I like to do is go in into the jungle trekking. And, I, you know, one of the things that you encounter in jungle trekking how many of you have been in tropical jungles before? Walked in tropical jungles before? Have you seen that before? Yeah. And you know, it's not just the wild animals people are afraid of. You rarely see wild animals because they hear you. They, 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 they scatter. But the one thing that you often see or feel or encounter in, in the walks in the tropical jungles are leeches. You know what they look like? You know leeches? Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I know there are sometimes, you know, leeches in society as well, but a lot of them are in the tropical jungle. Okay. And they come for your blood, right? I'm not afraid of leeches, but one day I walked into a leech nest. I didn't know about it. I was just standing there, looking and admiring the scenery up in the, you know, all the trees up there. And I heard rustling all around me on the dead leaves. And I thought, there's no wind blowing, so what's a rustle? I looked down and there were thousands of leeches coming for me. So what do you do when you see that? You run. You don't get paralyzed, you run. But another time I was taking a group of of city dwellers, uh, you know, and some girls uh, who were following, who was following part of the group from the city, and some of these girls, they'd have no idea what it's like in the jungle. They just wear, they wear shorts, you know, into the jungle. Their white thighs can be seen, and they walk there, uh, you know, in inappropriate shoes, and, and suddenly one of them scream. We all turned around. What's wrong? I've got something on my leg here. There's like something black on my leg. What's that? We said, it's a leech. A leech. Ah, somebody, it's only a leech. For goodness sake, just rub it off, pull it off, something. No, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Oh, somebody. Now, the question I have to ask you is, does she have the leech or does the leech have her? <laughs> now, it's so easy that when we have, but suppose it will have you. It will have your life. It will have your future. It will have your destiny because it will lock you in. Not only that, it will cap your potential. But suppose the language that will cap our potential. You know, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said this. He said, what lies behind us and what lies ahead of us is nothing compared to what lies within us. Because God has given you unlimited potential. Your potential is determined by the size of your God. Can somebody say an amen? amen? You may look at each other and say, I'm a five foot, you know, one, you know, 120 pounds. I'm not very much. But on spiritual terms, you could cast a giant shadow. It's limited by the size of your God. If you're a six foot five, big, you know, 250 pounder, but your spiritual size is weak and your God is small. That's your destiny. That's your limit. You don't believe me? You take a great white shark, a baby shark, 
put it into an aquarium, the shark will never grow bigger than the size of the aquarium. But you take that shark and release it out into the Pacific Ocean and it will grow longer than this whole stage up here. It will reach its potential. So when we speak the language of but suppose, we will never fulfill God's potential for our lives. Because every time God wants to grow us, but suppose God, but, but suppose it doesn't happen, but suppose. Instead of saying, but God, although I may be weak, but God, you've got to have a destiny for me. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, he will raise us up in Christ Jesus. Instead of saying that, we say, but suppose. You know, in the natural realm, there are people already who, who can overcome their handicaps. And we see them. Now you have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Holy Spirit in you. Can somebody say amen? You have more than enough, more than overwhelming abundance resource to overcome. But even in the natural realm, there are people who have overcome severe handicaps. I remember a medical student in my cohort. He was a stammerer. Now, um, you know, if you, you are, if you are a stammerer, it's a real challenge being a medical student. Uh, you know, other courses may not, but uh, in, med in medical uh, medicine, it's, it's a real challenge. Why? Because you have lots of ward rounds, clinical ward rounds. And these ward rounds, sometimes the professor, the dreaded professorial ward rounds, the professor comes together with all the specialists and all the consultants and all the junior doctors and all the medical students and all the other nurses and matrons and, and, and sisters, and you have to present your case or your patient and then argue the case for the diagnosis and the prognosis and the management and so on before this whole crowd. Now, the professor award rounds move around very fast, so you better be eloquent. And that's a nightmare if you have a stammer. How could... There was a, there was a student in my cohort, bright enough to get into medical school, but he, he, he was not eloquent of, 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 of speech. Now, I'm not trying to make fun of people who stammer, because God will, like, will enable you beyond and above exceeding to overcome that. But I dramatize it so that you, you could see what, what it's all about. When we present a patient, we would say, this is Miss Smith. She's 45 years old. She came in with chest pains and sweating. And she had uh, you know, blood pressure so much. And I made a diagnosis of ischemic heart disease or, or she has a coronary artery thrombosis. She has a heart attack. Uh, you, you can make that. You, can, you present that like this. But supposing you, you, you had a, a, a stammer, you would say, this is, this is Mrs. Smith. She is 45 years old. And everybody's standing there, oh, they're just trying to get it over and done. It's so embarrassing. It could be hell for you. But this guy, he realized that speech had something to do with the rhythm of his breathing. So he would beat out a rhythm as he spoke. He would beat out a rhythm on his lap. He would beat it out. And so this is what he would say. He would say, this is Mrs. Smith. She is 45 years old. She came in with chest pains and sweating and the blood pressure was so much, and I made the diagnosis of a heart attack. It was awesome just to watch him, you know. We listened, we didn't even listen to a single word he said. We were just watching that hand on the thigh all the time. <laughs> and he overcame that defect. He realized his potential. Now, that's in the natural. He did it naturally. Do you know some people whom you know had started with handicaps or stammer? Do you know Bruce Willis, the actor? was a stammerer? Do you know Benny Hinn, the healing evangelist, was a stammerer? Do you know Marilyn Monroe? How many of you know Marilyn Monroe? Can I see your hands? I don't know her, but I know of her, okay? So, <laughs> she, 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 she's dead, but she started life as a stammerer, as a child. She was a stammerer. So if in the natural, these people could overcome the stammer, what more about you? Your handicap. You have... God in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Somebody say amen. amen. You, you remember uh, um, uh, a man called Nick Wojcik? Do you, have you heard him? Nick Wojcik? You know, he, he's Aussie, but he lives in America now. And uh, he was born with tetramelia. He had no arms, no legs. You seen that guy? Nick Wojcik? Okay, he's written a book called Limitless, Unstoppable. You see him, it's an incredible guy. He came to Malaysia last year and I brought my daughter Sarah to listen to Nick Wojcik. He just sat in the front row of this wonderful uh, church and he was there up in the front on the table. He was, he was walking up and down the table. He was a fantastic inspirational speaker. But Nick Wojcik, when he was a teenager, tried to commit suicide. He was born in a Christian family 
And her family was totally taken aback when he was born without arms and legs. And as he grew up, he kept asking his mom and dad, why was I born like that? For what purpose? Why was I born like that? He, was, he, was, he was fell into depression because he laughed at school and everything else. And his family, could, his parents who were godly Christians said to him, Nick, you can complain for the rest of your life about what you don't have. Or you can thank God and use what you do have. He had a condition called tetramelia, which is, medically speaking, the absence of limbs, all four limbs. And so, but one day, he was reading the scriptures. He had tried to commit suicide twice. One day he was reading the scriptures. He came across John chapter 9. When a man who was born blind, the disciples asked Jesus, what was the reason this man was born blind? Was it because of his sin or the sin of his parents? And Jesus said, nothing to do with either. This man was born blind so that the glory of God may be revealed in him. That was a rhema to Nick Wojcik. He was born like this so that the glory of God may be revealed. And he stopped complaining about what he didn't have. And chose to believe God and use what he'd had. And his life changed. And from that day, Nick Vojic studied to get into university, graduate at a very high position in his class, and began to do an extra postgraduate degree. And now today you can see, he plays golf without limbs. He serves without limbs. Do you know, he plays soccer without limbs. It's incredible. He, get, he skydives, does all kinds of things without limbs. And now up to today, he's preached to over 300 million people at the age of 32. By the time he finishes his life, he would have preached to more people than even Billy Graham has had in his lifetime. He overcame it. Why? The power of God in his life. And as you know, he got married recently. And as you know, he now has a baby, a little child, you know, one-year-old. How does a man without limbs hold a child? You've got to watch his video on YouTube. You know, it's incredible. Just go Nick Wojcik and you'll see. Now, this is what God can do for your life, for the potential that He has put within you. Can somebody say an amen to that? But if you say, but suppose it will paralyze your potential, paralyze you, cap your potential, it will kill your faith. It will kill your faith. Faith killed Moses' no, fear killed Moses' faith for 40 over years. Fear of Pharaoh, fear of you know rejection, fear of death. You know, condemned him being being a recluse in the backside of Sinai Desert. Now God wants you to live a life of significance. How many of you believe God has a destiny for your life? Can I see your hands? A fantastic destiny for your life. Lift up your hand, wave it, wave it in the air, and turn to your neighbor, give them a high five, and say, God has a destiny for your life. You do that. What has killed your dream? Has it been a broken relationship? A divorce? A rejection? What has killed your dream? Has it been a failure in the business? Has it been because you've been abused by somebody when you were a child? Somebody you trusted? Could be even your own father that abused you sexually? Or is it because something else that, that, that you trusted God for didn't come to pass? And the devil has says to you, every time you want to walk out and step out in faith, the devil says, but suppose, it doesn't happen again, but suppose. And you begin to speak that language. It will kill your faith. Your faith can only grow that much, like a shark in an aquarium. It will never fulfill what God has for you until you change the language of your heart. Because fear will kill your faith. Fear will kill your faith. You know, fear sees the obstacle, somebody said. Faith sees the way. Fear sees the darkest night. Faith sees the day. Fear fails to take a step. Fear fails to take a step. It doesn't take a step. Faith starts to fly. Fear says, I dare not. Who dares? Faith says, I. You know, fear will kill our faith. It will kill our faith. And you know, it's so easy in medical circles. There's so many types of faith, fears that have become, you know, even medical conditions that people need to see a psychiatrist for. Well-defined medical conditions. For example, as you know, the fear of closed spaces is claustrophobia. Open spaces, agoraphobia. See, all these medical names, there are 280 medical phobias. And it's growing all the time. There's even the fear of money. People who fear money, it's called chromatophobia. Anyone got that problem? I can help you to solve that problem. <laughs> of course, there's fear of snakes, herpetophobia. Fear of spiders, arachnophobia. There's fear of spiders. There's even fear of pastors. It's called hierophobia. You don't have that because I know you have a loving pastor. Okay? 
You don't have that. There are also people that, who fear coming to church. There's a fear of coming to church. It's called ecclesiophobia. Truly, turn to your neighbor and say, you don't have that. All kinds of fears. Nancy, my wife, she had a fear of heights. Now, God delivered her incredibly from the fear of heights. You know, the first year after we were married, I took her up to climb Ben Nevis, the highest mountain in Britain. Okay, it's 4,000 over feet. I love climbing mountains, so I took her up uh, a year after marrying. It's just to test out whether she was a, a townie, you know, whether she could you know, hack it up there in the open. And she climbed up, fantastic, right at the summit. We got to the summit. And you know, but she didn't realize how high she was going because as you climb, you just look in the steps ahead of you. But when she got to the summit, she turned around and saw the whole expanse of the countryside, the tiny dots of cars in the distance, and the sea in the distance, and she realized how high up she was. And I said, darling, I'm going to go down now. And she immediately she sat down. She said, I can't. I said, why not? She said, I've got a fear of heights. I said, you should have told me that before we got married. No, I didn't say that. I said, I said we've got to go down. She said, I can't. She said, I said, you've got to go. And she says, no, the only way I can go is to slide down on my backside. So she slided down Ben Nevis on her backside, not standing up. She took longer going down Ben Nevis than we took climbing up. So when I went to Sabah, when I went back to Malaysia, we went back to Malaysia, you know, Sabah is a state where it's the highest mountain in Southeast Asia, Mount Kinabalu is. Some of you, you should climb it someday. It is three times the height of Nevis. And when I, when I first went back, I decided to climb this wonderful mountain. And uh, I thought as I stood on the summit, there's no way Nancy can climb this. Though. Forget it. It's three times the height of Nevis. And uh, so I, she said, how was it when I, when I came down? I said, no way you can climb it. So I climbed it many, many times. And then one day at a meeting just like that, a man of God came by and said, there are people here with fears. Fear of spiders, fear of snakes, fear of cockroaches. I said, you got all of those. And then she, he said, fear of heights. I said, that's it. It must be you. She says, I think it's me too. So she came up, got prayed for, fell under the power, got up off, uh, off the floor, came back. And I said, what happened? She said, I think I've been delivered from fear of heights. God did that. I said, well, proof of the pudding is in the eating. So let's test it. So, you know, a couple of days later, I took her up a hill about 800 feet high, overlooking the city. It's a very steep hill. We walked up and then she stood and overlooked the city. And I said, how is it? She says, very good. She didn't sit down on the backside. I said, can you walk down? I expected her to slide down. She said, no, I walked down. I said, can you run down? So she started running down with me. God had delivered her from a fear of heights. And I said, well, let's climb Mount Kinabalu. She said, okay. So on our 11th anniversary, it was 20 years ago now, we both climbed up Mount Kinabalu together. And there she stood on the summit, 13,500 feet now, with a 5,000 uh, feet drop, sheer drop behind her on the summit. And the fear of heights had gone. Hallelujah. God can deliver you from every fear. Can somebody say an amen to that? You want to give God a big clap? Give him a big one. Give him a loud shout. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, fear will paralyze us, will cap our potential, will kill our faith. You don't even believe that things can happen supernaturally in your family, in your life. You'll just live by the rational. But you need to speak, but, but God. Somebody say, but God. But God. What will but God do? You need to say it aloud. Say it loud. Everybody say, but God. Say it loud. But God. The devil will try to kill you, but... The devil will try to strip you of your destiny, but... God. The devil will try to break up your marriage and relationships, but... God. You need to learn to say, but God. Turn to your neighbor and say, but God. But God is the language of faith. Let's read it one more time. Ready, go. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. By grace, we have been saved. Firstly, He made us alive together in Him. He made us alive together. Everybody say together. The reason why you're here to, today is not because of some coincidence. God has brought you here together. Somebody say together. To make you alive. Alive in Him. You know, there's nothing more wonderful than to hear. You know, to together and the, the incredible kind of energy and passion in some of the kids are over that side. Amen. How many of you are young in Jesus today? Can I see your hands? Are you young in Jesus? The rest of you are old. 
I'm so sorry for you. How many of you are passionately young for Jesus today? Can I see your hands? The rest of you are still old, you know? How many of you are young for Jesus today? Can I see your hands? Give it a lot of big show! Woo! I will tell you this one thing. God has created you to burn for Him. Somebody say an amen. amen. Now, it's not, it's not wrong, and it's, it's important to get our doctrines and our thoughts right. But if you just get your doctrines right, the world will just, you'll just be admired. People will just admire you. You will never be contagious. Never. But when you burn for God, you will always be contagious. Why should the church be a place where there's no contagion? But the football fields and the rock hall, concert halls are the place where contagiousness resides. Because there's passion there. There's passion. How many of you, you want to grow more passionate for Jesus? Can I see your hands? Wave it in the air. Then you will be contagious. When you burn, you will be contagious. But you say, I've got my right doctrine. People will admire you. But you won't be contagious. You need to go beyond that. And to go beyond that, you have to learn to say, but God. Somebody say, but God. You know, that's so good to hear that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But God. Do you know, uh, when we say but God, it is the language of faith. Somebody say faith. faith. Now, I was just sharing with the people in Easter conference time. Do you know, what is faith like? Don't just go older for God. You know, some people, we think, we're growing more mature for Jesus. Hallelujah. I've been a Christian 20 years. Really? You're growing older for Jesus? More mature for Jesus? Not necessarily. You've just grown older, that's all. You know more Christian songs. Necess- we, we don't get into the, the, the kind of a, the sphere where you just know more Christian songs, more Christian jargons. You know, uh, you know more verses of the Bible only. Not that that's unimportant. It's very important. But you think you've grown more mature. Actually, you may not necessarily have grown mature in your faith. You not, have not necessarily grown in your faith. The Bible tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us that. I'll give you an example of what it means. When my son Andrew was four years old, I was walking past his table. He was on the tabletop playing Pirates of the Caribbean. And I said, Andrew, jump off the table. Dad will catch you. He said, no, I can't, Dad. It's too high. I said, look, trust Dad. Dad will catch you. And he said, no, no, Dad, I can't jump. Dad, you, I will fall and break my leg. And break my arm. Look, trust Dad. Dad will catch you. Dad, don't drop. Let me drop, okay? I will catch you, Andrew. Just jump. And he jumped. And when I caught him, he was delirious with joy. But I tell you, there was nothing compared to my joy. My son, trust me. My son, trust me. Faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now you know why. But I've been a Christian for 20 years. Have you grown in faith? Or you believe God healed 20 years ago. Do you still believe God heals today? Just in the same way, if He wants to, He can. You know, I just be- But you believe the same thing 20 years ago. Have you experienced? Have you seen it? Have you spoken into life to see Him being healed? To see people being healed? Oh, but I've got 20 years as a Christian. I've been there, done that. Really? You've grown older, but you've not necessarily grown in faith. Not necessarily grown more mature. All you've grown is just in age. My son Andrew is 24 years old now. Just imagine, he was playing on the table again, Pirates of the Caribbean. There's something wrong with that picture. And if I pass by the table, I say, Andrew, jump off the table. Dad will catch you. 24 years old. Now something is wrong with that picture. Do you understand that? That's why we must go in faith to please God. Can somebody say an amen? amen. Everybody say, but God. Because it's the language of faith. It is the language of faith. But you know, there was a man who was 24 years old, just like my son is today. He was working in an office block, sixth floor, and suddenly somebody shouted, fire, fire. And he opened the windows of the, of the, the office and saw f- the smoke and fire billowing from the fifth floor below him. He was trapped. All his exits were trapped. He didn't know what to do. The crowd had gathered. The fire brigade would come. And people shouted to him, jump, jump. He didn't jump because he couldn't see them clearly. They could see him. Firemen were having a canvas out, tarpaulin, you know, trying to catch him. People shouting, jump. But he couldn't even see that. And then he heard a voice. He said, jump, son. It's okay. Jump. It's his dad. And then he remembered Pirates of the Caribbean 20 years ago on the table. And his dad's son said, jump, son. I'll catch you. Now, 24 years later, sixth floor of a building, and he hears the same voice. Jump, son! It's okay, jump! He jumped, and they caught him. That's what faith is. That's how you need to grow in your faith. You must not just grow old as a Christian. 
You must grow in faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Somebody say an amen to that. And but God is the language of faith. How many want to grow faith in your life? Can I see your hands? Wave it in the air. Wave it in the air. Father, I pray for an impartation of faith this morning into this church that they will see as you see, not as they see, not with their minds just only, but they will see as you see. A fresh impartation of faith. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Very quickly now, but God will also do a second thing for us. It will raise us up together with Him. Somebody say, raise up. You know, I have before you today my daughter of 15 years old, 15 and a half years old, Sarah, she's almost 16. But at the age of four, she was found strangulated on a clothesline and brought down dead. Which is amazing. At the age of four. She was playing with a, a, a friend who was three years old in the backyard of uh, the violin teacher's house. And, uh, and my son was learning the violin at that time, so violin teacher was giving her the lesson. And her daughter, the three-year-old, was playing with Sarah. And somehow Sarah saw a rope that was hanging down from a clothesline with a noose in it and a stool at the bottom. And, uh, you know, where the wash basket used to be put. And she climbed up on it and then played, I, we don't know what happened, but she played with her head in the noose and, and then got panicked because she couldn't pull it up probably and then accidentally kicked the stool and strangled. Nobody found her until seven minutes later because a little child with limited vocabulary couldn't tell her mum what was happening. Eventually the mum went out after seven minutes, found her dead, lifeless, no pulse rate, no respiration, nothing. Pupils of the eyes fixed and dilated for you medics in the hot afternoon sun at four o'clock. And she was brought down. And this, this, this uh, violent teacher, she was a member of our church. She cried out to God, God! Psalm 34, I cried to the Lord and he heard me. She just cried out. And I got a phone call in my clinic from my son, frantically shouting down the phone, Dad, Sarah's dead, please come quick. How would you like call, call like that in your office? Got into the car, you know, whisked there as fast as I could, got caught in the traffic jam. They call the ambulance and everything else, but you know, but the thing is, and God said to me, this is an attack spiritually from the pits of hell. I was meant to lead a citywide prayer meeting for the city and God said it's an attack from the pits of hell. Speak life to your daughter. So I went there. The first thing I did when I arrived at the scene, you must understand they were doing CPR and all kinds of things trying to bring her life back. You know, when I, God had brought something back into her life by the time I got there. But you know, the first thing I did, instead of doing my medical thing, which I'm trained to do, which was really to, to do the CPR stuff and make sure airways, respiration, everything is okay and heart is okay. I immediately spoke to her body. I said, Sarah, in Jesus' name, you shall not die, but you shall live. I, I, I negate and nullify the spirit of death. Come out of her, in Jesus' name. I speak life into you. That's what I did. And the long and short of that was that her breathing continued to improve. Continued to, and her face, you know, the colors started coming back. Eventually, the ambulance came, we, eventually we got her to the hospital and uh, she was in a coma. She was in a coma. The church came to pray for her. You know, we cried out to God, but God, but God, we cried out for her. And you know, by midnight, everyone had disappeared from the hospital. Nobody could stay long. They all went back to the houses to pray. The prayer of the saints, the church was quite a young church then. And they prayed. And then, wonderfully, at two o'clock in the morning, she woke up suddenly from coma. And she cried out, Mommy! And Nancy said, Mommy's here. And her eyes were bright, wide open, but she had to feel for Nancy's face to kiss it. So I said, why is she doing that? Maybe she's blind. So I tested her for blindness. I took a hand and slammed it against her eyes, stopping a couple of centimeters away. She didn't blink. I took a watch, moved it in front of her. She didn't follow it. But when I shook the watch behind her, she turned. She could hear, she couldn't see. God had given me back my child. She was blind. Two o'clock in the morning. Then we continued praying. And just before four, I went to sleep because I was so tired with praying. And God gave me a dream that Sarah suddenly woke up and said, Dad, I can see, I can see. And counted to 11 with both hands. That's think about that dream I had. Counted to 11 with both hands. And I suddenly woke from the dream thinking my daughter can see. She was still blind. She was still asleep. But shortly after that, she just woke up and said, Dad, she said, that's the, the clock on the wall. She said, that's, that's nine o'clock. I said, no, Sarah, it's four o'clock because of the shadows on the wall. She said, four? She held up her hands just as I'd seen in the dream. One, two, three, four. And then she continued just like I'd seen in the dream. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
And I broke down. Nancy broke down. We just cried and wept. And I knew God gave me that dream so that I could never go back and find a rational medical explanation for it. Because I'm tempted to do that because I'm a rational man. To stop me from ever thinking going down that avenue so that I would know 100%, 101%, it is Him. And so, you know, when God does this, He will raise us up. Are your dreams dead? He will raise it up. Is your destiny dead? He will raise it up. Is your body dead? He will raise it up. Are your hopes dead? He will raise it up. It's Easter. He's a specialist in raising things up. Can somebody say an amen? amen? He's a specialist in making things alive again. Somebody say an amen. amen. And the third thing, but God will do it for us, is this. It will make us reign together with Him. Somebody say reign. reign. We are called to reign with Jesus in our lives. But set Him up. How? He wants us to sit up with Him in the heavenly places. Let's read it together. Go. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He wants to raise us up with Him so that you see as God sees. You see as God sees. You know, Mount Kinabalu is high. But when I'm up in a plane, when I'm climbing Mount Kinabalu, it's a giant of a mountain. It's huge. But when I'm 33,000 feet up in the air and I look at Mount Kinabalu, it's just a small rock. That's all. What's the difference? Height. When you see as God sees, the problems are no longer mountains. They become rocks. They become pebbles. He raised us up to sit with Him in the heavenly places. And where is the heavenly place? Well, the word, the phrase heavenly places is only found in one book. The book of Ephesians. That's where it comes from. It's not found in any other part of the New Testament. So if you want to know what it means, you read the book of Ephesians. Heavenly places. Well, simply speaking, heavenly place is the spiritual sphere where the devil can't get you. He can't pull you down. He can't touch you. He can't reach you. It's beyond him. It's just like a man who's uh, in an... I'm told, you know, I don't know whether it's true, but a World War II fighter pilot's plane was badly shot up and, you know, the engine was sputtering on his way back. It was crossing the, the, the channel uh, and the North Sea and it was really bad. And, uh, you know, then he heard, he was trying really to make it back home. And then he heard all kinds of noise coming from the engine and it got worse. And he realized that rats were chewing up the engine wires. What do you do? I mean, it's just a matter of time, a few more minutes, and we chew through the wires and that's it. The plane will fall out of the air into the sea. He's dead. So you know what he did? He took the plane higher. And it's higher. And it's went higher. The lack of oxygen rendered the rats unconscious or killed the rats. He brought the plane down again and reached home safely. Height, spiritually, takes you to a place where the devil can't get you. That's the heavenly place. He raised us up to sit with him. That means to reign with him in the heavenly place. Place. And it is in heavenly places that you will not only fly high, you will last long in your life. Some of us, we fly high, but we don't last long. Some of us, we grind along, we last long, but we never fly high. But in the heavenly places, you will fly high and you will last long. And you know when the, the supersonic sound barrier was broken in 1947, an American pilot by the name of Chuck Yeager did it. You know, if you try to fly supersonic speed at 33,000 feet, which is commercial aircraft cruising altitude, the whole plane would just disintegrate. The whole plane would just disintegrate. So Chuck Yeager, to do that, had to fly off, taken by an airplane right up to 33,000, his jet, jet sitting on a commercial airliner, and then from there, he shot off to about 47,000 feet, where the air is thinner, where the devil can't get you. And then from there, he throttled up the engine and broke the sound barrier. 1947. You want to fly high? You want to last long? You want to go at the speed of what the Holy Spirit is doing? Heavenly place. And the heavenly place comes from a posture of our hearts that say, but suppose. Not but suppose, but but God. When the devil tries to say to us, but suppose this, but suppose that. We say no, but God says this, but God says that. But God says, I can but God says, I will. But God says, that's my promise. And that's where God brings us into the destiny. 
Everybody say, but God. Everybody say aloud again. Say, but God. That is what God is going to do in your life. That is going to bring you to your destiny. Friends, you cannot count the number of, you can count the number of seeds in one apple, somebody said. But you cannot count the number of apples in one seed. What God can do with your life, just one life. You cannot count its potential. But if you walk with but God, instead of but suppose, you will fulfill your potential. You will fulfill your destiny. You will fulfill all that God has for you in the name of Jesus. Right now, as you, as you, as you are here right now, praise God. All heads bowed, all eyes closed right now. I've finished what I want to say this morning. I'm going to say one thing. I'm going to make a call for you on Easter Day. Today, Jesus makes a life many lives. Amen? Amen? Today, I plead with you to give your heart to Jesus. God did not bring you here by coincidence or accident. Although somebody might have persuaded you to come, or you may have come to the church many times before, but you've never given your heart to Jesus. Today, you give your heart to Jesus today. Today, trust in Jesus who died for you on the cross on Good Friday and rose on Easter Sunday for you. Today, your life will never be the same again. You will move into the heavenlies. You will fulfill your destiny. Fear will not paralyze you again in your life. God has a destiny and a purpose for you. Now, if today this is what you want to do, and I ask you today is the best thing you can do is to give your heart to Jesus. Open your heart and receive Him today. He's here. He's alive. He's here to give you life and hope. He's here to give you His love. He's here to bring you forgiveness of your sins. He's here to give you a new beginning for your life. If that's your desire, well, here's what I want you to do. You say, Pastor Philip, I want to give my heart to Jesus today. I want to respond. I want to receive Jesus in my heart today. Then can you just raise up your hand? Raise up your hand and look at me. Raise up your hand, wave it in there so that I can see it. Look at me so that I can see your eyes. I will acknowledge you. Once I acknowledge you, you can put down that hand. Can you do that now? At the count of three, just raise up your hand. You say, Pastor Philip, I want to receive Jesus. Raise up your hand right now. I see a hand over there, brother. See a hand? Both of you over there in the name of Jesus. Keep your hand up, brother, until I acknowledge that. I, the Lord loves you. He has brought you here, not by coincidence, because He loves you. He wants you to know His love for you today, that your sins are forgiven, both of you. You have a new beginning. You have a destiny, my brother. The power and the love of God comes upon your life today. Give your heart to Jesus as you have done today. Walk with Him because He will be with you for the rest of your life until you see Him face to face. And I thank you for that, brother. You may put down your hands. Thank you very much. EC, you know, I, I want you to just take note. Those of you who are counselors, please take note. Brother over there with a the hand up, God bless you. God has touched your life. When you give your heart to Jesus, it's the best thing that can ever happen to your life. Today, salvation has come into your life. To get, today, my friend, God's love comes into your life. Today, a new beginning, a new destiny. All those bondages that hold you back are broken in Jesus' name. I bless you. You may put down your hand now. God bless you. Anyone else to say, you say, Pastor Philip, I want to receive Jesus. I see your hand, brother. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, for it's a power of salvation. Today, salvation come into your life, brother. God bless you. Today, I speak life. I speak blessing. I speak a new hope into your life. Today, God comes into your heart to change you from the inside out eternally. He is your Lord and Savior. Today, God will, will give you a new hope and destiny. Surrender to the Lord because your past will never hold you back now in the name of Jesus. Anyone else? Young man, open your heart to Jesus today as you have and the joy of the Lord will continue to, to, continue to invade your life. I see the joy of God in you, a new hope in you. Today is a new beginning, young man. Together, today, God changes your name to become beloved. You are beloved of God. Beloved. And you have a destiny. You will be the head, not the tail. You will be above, not beneath in the coming days for your generation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone else there? I see a sister, just lift up your hand. Thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you for, for your daughter here. God has touched your life today. He's brought you here so that you may know a new beginning, a new hope for your life. Don't let disappointments and things of the past hold you back. Don't let shackles hold you back. God gives you a new hope and a new freedom today. In Jesus' 
My sister, you have a new freedom. In Jesus, Jesus says to you, my daughter, I give you my freedom. I give you my love. Today, I set you free for nothing of the past holds you back. I speak right now God's destiny and love for your life. Today, you are set free to live with a new hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, sister. Anyone else? I see two hands over there. Two young men. You come give your heart to Jesus. May you be blessed today. Because as God takes your life, that's the best of your life that's yet to come. The best is yet to come for you. What has come in the past is nothing compared to what God has prepared for you. The disappointments, the hurts, the failures, the setbacks of the past, even the successes, is nothing compared to what God has for you. For both of you, you are both children of destiny in the realm of the kingdom of God. Lord, thank you. I pray that the reality of God come into your life today. Today, walk with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Give your heart to Him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You may put down your hands. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? This whole family here, lift up your hands for Jesus. I bless this whole family. May you be blessed with a new love for Jesus. It's Easter. This Easter is the first of this Easter for you. It will never be the same again. In Jesus' name. Thank you for this new life. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Give your heart to Jesus. Wave it if I don't see it. Wave it if I don't see it. I see your hands over there, all three, all two of you. In Jesus' name, as a cup. I pray right now for the love of Jesus to fill your heart today as you give your heart to Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Praise you. I see a sister over there. Hands up as well. Thank you. Lady in black. Thank you. The Lord bless you. I see the hand. A new hope and a destiny. The love of God coming into your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Anyone else? You're going to give your heart to Jesus today. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. God is here. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Now I ask all of you to stand up right now. Praise God. All those who have raised up your hand just now, can you just raise it one more time for me? Just raise it, wave it in the air one more time for me. Okay? One more time for me. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer in a short while. I'm going to ask you, if you raise your hand, never be ashamed of Jesus. Just come forward right now. Can you, can you just come forward? Because I want to shake your hands personally. Let's give the Lord a big hand for all of them. Just come forward. Just come forward. Come forward. Just come forward. Wonderful, young man. Wonderful. Just come forward. Just keep, come down. Don't worry about people to your right and left. Just come down. Just come down. Come forward. Come forward. Just come down. Just come. Church, let's give the Lord a big hand because this is Good Friday. Good is Easter Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. Hallelujah. It's Easter Sunday. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray a simple prayer together. The presence of God is here. The love of God is here. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer together. Church, you pray this prayer with me. And those of you in the front, you pray the prayer to receive Jesus into your heart. Amen. Pray it in your heart. Pray it aloud. And pray it as you mean it. Because Jesus has come into your heart today. Salvation has come into your life. Are you ready now, church? You pray the prayer. You pray. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Say it loud. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Thank you for your love for me. Thank you for your love for me. On this Easter Sunday. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart, to be my Lord, my Savior, my Master. I surrender my life to you. Thank you that on the cross, on Good Friday, you took away my sins. I give you praise today. I invite you to come into my life. I surrender my life to you. Fill me with your spirit. So that the past cannot lock me in anymore. Today, I have a new hope, a new future, a new destiny in you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The devil may say to you, but suppose, but we all say. The devil may say, but suppose, but we all say. We all say. But God. God has brought the salvation to your life in Jesus' name. Praise God. The counselors will spend a bit of time maybe taking some details and praying with you. Don't go back to your seats yet. For the rest of you, how many of you want to grow in faith and you're going to chart the language of but, but God? Can I see your hands? No more but suppose. Everybody say no more but suppose. Turn to your neighbor and say no more but suppose. Turn to another one and say no more but suppose. 
Turn to somebody and say, but God. But God. But God. Lord, I just pray for a new, wonderful beginning for each and everyone here in their journey of faith with you. Today, you love us. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. He has loved you ever in, incredibly beyond all you can ever comprehend. Through the cross, you see that. And today, don't hold back with what the devil lies to you. With But suppose this, but suppose that. Speak from your heart, but God. And I pray today that you will fulfill in the name of Jesus all that God has for you. You will not live anymore in a small aquarium. You will live in the sea of God's love, the sea of His grace, the sea of His faith and His destiny for you. Somebody say amen. Amen. And I pray God this church will grow in faith on this Easter day, that you will resurrect again dead hopes to God, dead lives to God, dead bodies in the name of Jesus, so that this church rises up to be a church that doesn't say, but suppose this, but suppose that, but it says, but, 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 praise God, give the Lord a big hand, amen. Get us to dance, get us to dance, get us to dance, get us to dance. Get us to dance. I'm going to ask Marilyn to, to get us to dance right now, okay? Just a very quick one. He's going to sing a wonderful song. Yeah. Let's our get God dancing in the name of Jesus. We want to declare our God is greater. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Oh, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher yeah, than, than any, any other. other. Our God is healer. Awesome and power, our God. Our God, sing it out. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome and power, our God. Our God, woo! Water, you turn into wine. You open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. And into the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Let's declare, come on. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power, our God. Our God, sing it out, come on. Our God is greater.
to stand, come on. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? Then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? Our oh, God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our oh, God is healer. God raised Jesus from the dead. <laughs> but God is for you. Can you say that? But God is for me. Come on, say this. But God is for me. Who can be against me? Hallelujah. We praise him. We bless him. Hallelujah. Well, Father, we just thank you that you surprise us. Lord, thank you for this gathering of a harvest of brothers and sisters getting saved that's the greatest joy they can bring to the heavenly realm it's a sinner that comes to the living God and father we just thank you that it is possible that though we may say that London is or England is so hard or Westminster is so hard to the gospel but God loves the people in Westminster <laughs> but God can work powerfully far more you can ever ask or imagine to each one of us Say, yes, Lord, I'm willing. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord I'm willing. Come on. Yes, Lord, I'm willing to be resurrected. Amen. To be resurrected of our dreams, Amen. of our possibilities, yes. of all the potential. Yes. In the name of Jesus, we give you the, all the glory, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a clap and offering. Oh, happy Whoa. day. Happy, happy day. day. Happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever. in history death is beaten you have rescued me sing it out Jesus is alive <laughs> the empty cross the empty grave life eternal you have a wonder day sing it out Jesus is alive <laughs> he's alive In that place, a free and last meeting face to face. I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. And it's your perfect peace. Every pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. Sing it out, church. Come on. 